I lived here, and both my kids were born here. So I went to Brookside School right on North Street. I worked at Mariposa Produce, and I worked in several restaurants, so it's, it's had a special affection for Willett, so it's really cool to be coming back and to have the opportunity in my job now to maybe do some workshops at Willits. And I've worked for North Coast Opportunities for 27 years, so I'm kind of a lifer there. And I was the nutrition coordinator for the Head Start program for many years. I was a cook first, and then I became a nutrition coordinator. And just a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to take on a grant from the coordinator of the grant that I'll tell you a little bit about, and it's um, some really good work we're doing. So we have all of these grants going right now. The Farm to Pool grant is actually working with Bechtel uh, Middle School, uh, doing some cafeteria promotion. And then we have the Gardens Project, that many of you probably heard about, and have more information on that. And they have Food Corps and Health Corps, which is the new division of AmeriCorps, which are young people who come and do some fabulous work in our community. And uh, the Food Hub is a, new, is a grant that runs the same amount of time as the food prep that I'm doing. And it's looking at developing distribution for local farmers, setting up systems that make it easier for them to sell locally. It's a really fabulous program. And there's going to be an online ordering system that will kick off in about a month. And then the food prep is the one I'm for here. I'll tell you more about that. Leaders for a Healthy Community is something that Tarni Sheldon is doing, where she brings uh, people who are interested in health, um, working in a different organization, school, uh, health department, whatever, that want to just up the wellness factor and do some great project around uh, promoting health in their program. And Lake County, we have a farm to school. We're trying to get something going there with farmers selling to the schools. And we also just got a farmer's market promotion program. So this is a one-year grant, and we hired Ian Fitzpatrick, who's from Wallets, and does some great marketing, and he's going to really try to uh, just add this whole new element to the farmer's market to get people more excited about coming, and really working, too, on the whole EBT match, so getting people who have EBT cards to be able to double their women at the farmer's market, which is fabulous. And then we're uh, working with the Grange Farm School out of Ridgewood Ranch, which is a wonderful place if you haven't been there. Uh, and then we're all part of the Food Policy Council, and that's a meeting that's open to the general public, so if you're interested in things going on in the community around food, farming, environment, it's just a great group of people to get together once a month and focus on what we're going to do to make changes. We have this document called the Food Action Plan that we are working off of. That, uh, it's really some good work. So. Feel free to join in there if you're interested. So the goal of the food prep grant that I'm working on is to increase the utilization of local specialty crops. Does anybody know what a specialty crop is? It sounds so special and so weird, it's so different, but really, it is fruits and vegetables, pretty basically. It's herbs, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, and nursery crops, and flowers. So really what it isn't is meat, dairy, and grain. So the whole grant is focused around getting people to buy more fruits and vegetables locally uh, and, and how to utilize those. So it's pretty broad, but the grant that I'm working on is pretty specific on our goals. So probably preaching to the choir here, but why eat local? Well, we all know that local food is, is tastes better, it's more nutritious, because uh, it's usually picked uh, right away. Like when you go to the farmer's market, those farmers have picked it that morning day before, they're just, you know, it's, it's really at its peak of freshness, which means it's at its nutritional peak, uh, so it's crisp and flavorful and, you know, just a lot better for you. Uh, most food is really old by the time we get it in the stores. It's been transported so far, it's just really old, and so then the sugars turn to starch and the cells shrink, and it really loses its vitality. It also loses a lot of vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, so that uh, food that's picked fresh is a lot better for us. And really, fresh food really equals health, right? You know that there's pharmaceutical companies out there like working frantically trying to develop things to treat all the illnesses, and so many illnesses are related to what really what we're putting into our bodies. So really, getting to look at you know prevention rather than treatment. It seems like uh, I think we spend about five percent of our dollars on prevention, and about ninety-five percent in this country on treatment. So when you go to the doctor, you get that pill or that prescription for something you need to do to cure your problem, but really doctors should be giving out a little more recipes in my mind, really teaching people how to eat healthier food. So the second reason is that local food preserves genetic diversity. 
And so large commercial farms grow uh, these hybrid crops. They pick one that's really easy to transport that they can grow massive amounts of and put in trucks and ship off to far distances. Whereas uh, the smaller farmers grow a number of varieties. They don't just grow a monocrop, crop. They grow lots of different varieties. And when they're growing, they're picking things that are more heirlooms, that they can be passed down, that they can save the seeds and have for generations to come. So they really take a lot more care to grow these really delicate, beautiful fruits and vegetables. And the third reason we should eat local is it's just better for the environment. So uh, the large uh, farms typically don't practice organic methods. A large organic farms are out there. But typically, there's more corporate farms that are um, you know, really not doing the best practices to protect the environment and often um, you know, using a lot of travel miles, like 1,500 miles to get your food to you, so there's a lot of fossil fuels. So when you're driving up Highway 5 and there's trucks going this way and that way, with tons of food on them, when in fact, you know, it's, you know, we can grow a lot of our own food. And I think in Willits, there's a lot going on in terms of people growing their own food. We're doing a really good job of that. And local food supports the future of local farmers. And so the American farmer is really a vanishing breed, and it's really hard to be a farmer. And in this job for the last two years, I've got to meet a lot of local farmers, and they work so, so hard. So I feel like you know, when I go to the farmer's market, um, you know, and I hand over that dollar, I just feel like I'm voting for them. I'm like, here, thank you. Thank you for what you do. And I see their little kids there, and I'm like, I'm going to buy some food from you because I really believe in what you're doing. And just so many local farmers, they really, really care about what they're doing and are really committed to their community. Um, so local farms keep our community, they keep the grandchildren and, and uh, having access to nourishing flavorful food and abundant food. And when you choose to buy local, you raise the consciousness of your family and your friends and your neighbors. I take a lot of my friends to the farmer's market. I call them up on Saturday, just on Saturday and I call them, like, go on the farmer's market. We all gather down there and, you know, I just kind of show them around and, and vote with my dollars. And I always feel really good when I leave the farmer's market. And then also local food builds community. So getting to know the farmers, you grow your food, you build understanding, you build trust among the people who are growing your food, and it goes both ways. They trust you, you trust them, and it builds this real connection. I know I have a lot of friends I've made at the farmer's market. I can't walk the market without chatting with every farmer as I go along, and it's just a real special thing. So also another way to eat local is to grow your own, right? So I'm sure a lot of you have gardens or access to gardens, and uh, you know, in Willis there's a lot of, uh, well, there's the beautiful hospital garden, right? It's wonderful up and running, and there's a garden out there. Is, that, is the senior center garden now? Yeah, beautiful. And there's the um, lots of going on with school gardens. Uh, and, but just, I'm going to give you an example of just, if, if you don't have a garden space, uh, ways that you can do uh, small gardens in your home. And this is my favorite pot that I use a lot. Uh, I do this a lot with the kids in the preschools because I do a lot of trainings for preschool teachers and elementary, uh, young elementary kids. And these are great if you don't have a garden and you just want to put something on a patio or on a table or just lay it in your yard. This is my potato pot. And so I... Yeah, move it that way. Oh, move it that yeah. way. All right. So I put a couple potatoes in the bottom of here about a month ago and then I covered it with dirt and then a little green start is brought up, and they cover them with dirt again, and the greens come up, and they cover it again until it gets to the top. And this will just get bigger and bigger and get white flowers on it, and then the plant will die. And then it's a great one to teach kids because it dies, and all the energy goes into the potato. And so then they can just dump the pot out, and there'll be a whole bunch of potatoes in there. So these are, I mean, they come in all different sizes. They're, they're smaller than this, they're, they're this big around, and so it's a great way to just. Uh, grow one plant on your patio, and they breathe really nicely, and so it's really, really easy to grow things in there. So that's a good way. This is peas that I grew at my house. So that's just one smaller than that kind of pot filled with peas. That's all it took was just a little handful of peas. Uh, that's a community garden up in Brook Trails. So they have a beautiful garden going on up there. And school gardens were very involved in the school gardens. And when I was in Head Start, I had six gardens going with the preschoolers. So getting kids to eat broccoli wasn't hard because we were growing it. And so we would just do this fun little activity. We'd be like, we're going to go to the garden. And we'd show them a bro piece of broccoli and say, you go to the garden. We're going to look for this in the garden. And then they go out hunting for the garden. 
broccoli hunt, and when they find it, then the prize is they get to eat it. Yay! Yeah. It's like this big exciting thing. If you, you put the broccoli on the table, they don't eat it, right? But if you do it that way, they're like chomping. And as you get two and a half year old kids chomping on the broccoli, it's like a big prize. It's all about the grazing. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the Garden Project that's programmed through NCO. And we do a lot of workshops, and primarily they're in Ukiah, but not for any reason other than that's just where our office is, and people ask, a lot of the community gardens in Ukiah ask to have workshops there, but definitely if people have an interest in doing a workshop, feel free to contact us, I have a brochure over there. We do lots of great uh, seed planting, uh, weeds, uh, irrigation workshop we just did, and we do a lot with uh, the school gardens too. So this was like a, a Willinson start actually, a work day where we just got a bunch of parents together to talk about how to work in the garden with their kids. So there's just tons of opportunities for workshops. And if you go on the Gardens Project website, you can see the events that are coming up. So when it comes to preserving the harvest, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of information. Maybe some of you are even really familiar with how to preserve food, but I just put this together with a little basics of uh, why we should be preserving our food and how. So looking first at like dehydrating. Dehydrating is great. I bought this beautiful dehydrator that's in the picture there from Cabela's. It's really for drying meat and making jerky, but it works great for vegetables. It's about this tall and has 24 trays in it. Plug mm -hmm. it in, it's really fabulous. Uh, and we were able to do a lot of production with that. So it's one of the oldest methods, and it's really great because it just removes the moisture from the food. So then the bacteria, the yeast, and the mold can't grow, and so then food doesn't spoil. So some of the benefits to dehydrating are that it's really simple. It's safe, it's easy, it's really easy to learn. Uh, and it can be a great alternative to canning, which takes a lot more work and time and equipment uh, and, and freezing. Dry foods take up so little space, right? Because you've got this big thing of animals, you dry them down to nothing, so space is an issue in my house. So I really like all my dehydrated food. And it's great to use up a surplus, so like when all those you know, crop the gleaning of the apples, it's a perfect thing to do is to just dry them all and, and use them later. And it can be done year-round and no refrigeration, so that's a big plus. And the nutritional value of dehydrated food is really great because it's, it really is the same in the calories, it's just more concentrated down. Uh, no change in fiber, so you don't lose the fiber, which is so important. Vitamin A, pretty well retained. Vitamin C, gets destroyed if you're blanching uh, from vegetables. If you blanch vegetables, you lose a little vitamin C, but you still retain the A. Uh, and then the minerals, you can lose some of the minerals, trace minerals, uh, when you're rehydrating, so in, in the soaking water. But if you save the soaking water and put it in something else, then you're good. Uh, you can lose no iron when you're processing food dehydrating. So there's several methods. The first one is the solar. I remember when I lived in Willits, I actually had a little tray just like that one with the tomatoes. Uh, it was great. Uh, only, it's recommended for fruits only because they're high in acid, so they're, it's a little better for preserving. Uh, one of the downsides is they put the flies all over them, so you really have to have something that's you know, really uh, sealed uh, trays. I used to just lay mine out and then take parchment paper and cover it and then clothespins all around the outside. It could be shaded and uh, work pretty well. So for nothing, you know, stuff hanging around the house, you can still dehydrate. Uh, ovens work, but it has to go below 140, so a lot of them don't, and then you burn your food if it's too hot. Uh, electric ones are great. I like that one on the right. The red one is uh, Excalibur. They're made in Sacramento, and it is a really nice dehydrator. Yeah. You have them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're really good. That size? Uh-huh. Yeah. So you can rotate the trays, and you can set a timer. Does yours have a timer? The newer ones have a timer. So once you get it down, because there's a lot of playing around with dehydrating. You experiment until you get it just right. And then once you get it right, you can set the timer, and the temperature uh, shuts off when it's done. What was the name of that one? Excalibur? Excalibur. And I got mine on the phone. You got mine on Christmas. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know to keep around. Uh, yeah, the round one's not so great usually because they just have like a little fan blower in the bottom and they don't really do much, whereas the Excalibur has like more of a circulating air system so it really moves it around. Uh, the round ones like that that don't have a circulating fan, then you end up having to move the trays like constantly. Stuff on the bottom gets burned, and stuff on the top doesn't get dried. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably the best one I've ever seen, other than the, the Cabela's one, but that's a $600 item. So, it 
its calories are rich. So some tips for dehydrating, uh, consistent temperature, and that's where the outside solar ones can sometimes be a problem because it's like getting too much moisture and then they start to get moldy uh, when it gets the temperature drops at night. So really looking at uh, even temperature, and that's where if you can shut it off with a timer works really great. So you want to remove the moisture quickly as possible. That's the idea is to get the moisture out of there quickly as possible because if it takes too long, then moisture is one of those things that causes foodborne illness and mold and you want to be able to just move it out as quick as possible. And you want to know when your food is dry, so periodically checking, rotating the trays. I think all of them, kind of, even those X calories, you still got to pay a little attention. You got to babysit them a little bit and move them around. But if you, you cut a piece in half and check for moisture, you can usually tell if it's done. Uh, and then if you fold it on itself and it sticks, it shouldn't stick to itself. So if it sticks, then it's still too moist. So that's one way to check it. And then you really should put them in a glass container when you're done, like two-thirds full, and then check for moisture. So that's a good way, that's called conditioning. So you put it two-thirds full, put the lid on. If you get see any moisture on there, that probably needs to be dry, it probably needs to go back in. So that's a, a good test. And if you let it sit in there for a few days, you can get an idea of whether they're done or not. So local picks for dehydrating. Think about all the great crops that we have, the best ones, really apples are wonderful for dehydrating. And I did a big project with uh, the Fort Street project down in Ukiah, and we dehydrated hundreds of pounds of apples from gallons and made an apple crisp, a dried apple crisp recipe out of that. It was really fabulous that they ended up selling as a product for the holidays. Uh, strawberries are great for dehydrating. Grapes are really labor intensive. I've tried that a couple times. So you're supposed to put them in hot water, boiling water, and crack the skins first, and then dry them. And so you end up with this big process, and then you end up with these very tiny, tiny little <laughs> things. So it was fun. I'm glad I did it. I have a ton of grapes and a bunch of friends. It might be worth doing, but it's definitely labor intensive. Figs obviously are great. Peaches are wonderful. Peaches and pears and apples can also be done in that same apple crisp way, where you dehydrate them and then rehydrate them later. And you just put them in a pan with, uh, we just did apple juice and water, a little uh, sugar and flour, stir it up, and then put it in the oven for 20 minutes, take it out, um, make a crumb topping with like oatmeal and butter and cinnamon, and put it on, and put it back in for 20 minutes, and you've got this beautiful apple crisp. It's so easy, it's done in like 45 minutes. And so just saving up those apples, dehydrating them, and then in the middle of winter making crisp is really nice. Plums obviously are great. Dried onions are wonderful. Peppers, perfect. Really simple. Tomatoes are obviously one of the most popular. I dry a lot. I dry the Juliettes. Has anybody dried a Juliet tomato? They're about that big, and they, they uh, slice just perfectly into these little circles. They all kind of come out with the way they're shaped. The circles all come the same size. When you line them up on the trays, you end up with these beautiful little circles, and they kind of have a firm enough skin that they stay together, and they're kind of dry enough that they just they just dry perfectly. Um, zucchini, great. Herbs, I do a lot of drying herbs. Probably is dry herbs as well. Love doing herbs. I went out in my garden this morning and picked my little sprig of all little things, and I just feel like it's the best way to flavor food is dry herbs. So I often dry like rosemary, thyme, sage oregano, and then when they're all dried, I put them in like the food processor with a little bit of my like granulated garlic. I'm just putting that to just kind of grind it down and give it that extra little touch. So I put a little salt, a little pepper, a little red chili flakes in there. And so it just gets this really fragrant, perfect seasoning that I just use on everything. And if I have dried citrus peel, I'll add that. So I'll come with like the, the rind, I'll get my microplane out and dry that and then Mix that in as well, and I gave that away at the holidays last year to everybody. Everybody's begging for more, but just the whole like your food smelling like that passes around. You just get a little hint of it. It's just like this little essence of seasoning. Um, so I can't say that, but in those pots are fabulous for a little herb garden. So if you got one of those pots, you can put like three herbs in there and just keep watering, and you'll have herbs forever. And most herbs are perennial, so they just keep growing and growing and coming back. The herbs you have to be a little bit careful with with the hydrate. Do you dry herbs as well? No, I usually just hang them. Just hang them, right. Yeah. Okay, so I do that, and then I put them in the brown paper bag to keep them away from the light, and then and I hang them. But you can't, you can't do it in the hydrate, but if it's too hot, you hang them. You don't really need to. Yeah, that's not great. So then there's freezing. I, I love working with freezing. Uh, so it's quick. 
convenient way to preserve fruits and vegetables. It's the way that really preserves the greatest nutrients, too. Um, I love to look at these bags, the way they did that. Uh, I do a lot of mine in, in Ziploc bags like that, and then I just lay it down flat. Like if I have something saucy or soup, I just lay it down until it's frozen hard, and then I you know, label it, and then stack them all up so I get them all like lined up with a library of frozen food in my freezer. <laughs> Uh, and the benefits, they retain nutritional value and flavor. The bacteria become dormant, so that's a good thing. Fruits and vegetables and herbs, they can be pureed and frozen for use in recipes. So, so many things you can just puree and freeze up and then just have for cooking later on. So the tips to really pre-treat your produce, it's very important. So blanching your vegetables, most vegetables need blanching, because really it destroys the microorganisms, it really brightens the color, preserves the texture. So when you get like broccoli and you put it in the blancher and you boil it for just a couple minutes, take it out, put it in an ice bath, and then strain it, you get that bright green color. So fresh, so perfect. Um, I did it with some kale the other day, it turned out so good. And we just blanched it for two minutes, squeezed all the water out, laid it out to a little uh, moisture gun, and then we uh, vacuum sealed it. So we had these little bags of kale that then, you know, you just want a quick meal, and you don't want to like get out the kale and wash it and take the stems off and chop it and deal with it. It's already there. You just like cut it open, put it in your dish, and you get kale. So it's a really, once you, you know, put the work into it, you really end up with a really nice product that you can use anytime. Uh, and then with fruits, the ones that darken. So, you know, you, you don't have to pre-treat those, but really if you want to uh, not have that dark color, then you can really just use a simple soaking solution. And one of the things we did uh, when I was working with the apples with forestry was we put just bought citric acid. And that's something you can just buy in bowl, like Mariposa has it in bowl. And you just put like a teaspoon and a quart of water, and then it's a really inexpensive way to do it. And like the other products like Fruit Fresh and things like that have sugar in them. You don't want to sugar your product and you don't want to buy something like that. So it's better to just buy your own citric acid in bulk and then just put it in the water. Can you, use lemon juice you can do lemon juice, you can do pineapple juice, you can do orange juice. Yeah. So when we were doing it, we didn't want to spend the money on all the orange juice the right. juice, so we just did the citric acid and it worked really great. Yeah. You can buy ascorbic acid as well, which is yeah. vitamin C. Yeah. So there's several ways you can do it, but we kind of looked into the least expensive, most effective, and that seemed to work. And important that when you're sealing your bags to seal the containers and get the air out. So food savers are a wonderful device. Uh, not always so great if there's a lot of liquid in there, but uh, good for drier products. Um, my grandma always did it. We put it on a Ziploc bag and then seal or the not, not even a Ziploc bag, it's some kind of other bag. And we fold it over and then we put the straw on the corner and suck it out, right? Okay. I do too. I can see it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it works. Yeah. And so then laying them until they're frozen and stacking them on top of each other. And the most important, I think, about freezing is really labeling, dating, and rotating. And it's so easy to just not do that and like find things in the back of your freezer. Yeah. It's just like, like yeah, I try so hard to like really just pull stuff forward and put stuff in the back and really kind of organize my little library in my freezer. Uh, last night I pulled out some chili, I was in a pinch, and like you know, 10 minutes I had to be somewhere. I pulled it out of the freezer and put it in a pot. It was not done. That was it. So yeah, it's really great, but they have to be accessible. You can't, you know, end up with that thing in the back. They got freezer burned, and it's three years old now, and it's really garbage in such a way. So if you really pay attention to it. Freezing can be a wonderful way to preserve your food. So top picks for freezing. There's so many local crops that we can freeze. So apples, obviously. The berries love just like laying the berries. Go to the farmers market. I usually buy two. I buy one for eating during the week. Take the other one and wash them, juice down, and put them on a tray, pop them in the freezer for half an hour, an hour, take them out, put them in a Ziploc bag, and then I use them for smoothies. For, if you, cut, you can cut them up, slice them, whatever you want, but I just do, do a bowl and throw them in the smoothies, it works great. Grapes are great for freezing and just eating frozen grapes. Uh, peaches, I have a peach tree, so I do a lot of freezing peaches. Uh, and then in the middle of uh, because so, it's a short window where your peaches are ready, and so then kind of like October, you're like so happy, or December even, that you have peaches still in your freezer. Broccoli is one of the easiest and really efficient to freeze. Carrots are great, super easy. You slice them up, blanch them, freeze them. Cauliflower, same thing. Corn, if you can get your hands on it these days, it's wonderful to freeze. Uh, peppers, and peppers is one that you don't have to blanch, so it's really easy to just 
slice up peppers, chop up peppers, um, and just put them in a bag and freeze them. Uh, squash, so there's so many different kinds of squash you can freeze. Butternut squash, uh, does anybody else put some butternut squash? Cubed. It, you don't have to do anything to it, it's the easiest. Once you cut it up, cube it, you just put it in the bag and suck your air out, and you, you've got uh, sort of the spaghetti squash. I've never frozen spaghetti squash. I would think it would work really well because it's got plenty of moisture. Yeah. Right. Usually that one just, just gets eaten. So I always think those squashes is lasting. I mean, they last for right. long, so I never think about preserving them. Right, it's true. Yeah, the winter squash is the best. Even if you cube it, like we cubed it up in one of my workshops, and it was good for like five, six days in our refrigerator, just cubed. So I ended up using it all. But when I had a really abundant crop, uh, we had frozen it like that. It was great. So other things that are so wonderful about freezing is making actual products and freezing them. So sauces, like making applesauce and freezing it, uh, berry sauce, like for uh, waffles and pancakes is wonderful. And obviously tomato sauce, like making great marinara or spaghetti sauces and freezing them. And just having them all ready to go in quart bags is wonderful. Pie fillings, I got really into the pie filling, and I usually do crisps instead of pie. It's just easier for me to do a crisp, and I like to do like the oatmeal just the big crust on the bottom and the crust on the top. So I did a lot of uh, berries when I had them and mixing them together. So when I had my peach trees just loaded, I sliced them all up, uh, put them in the citric acid, uh, just a little bit of sugar maybe so that it was ready to go and then put a few berries in there and then popped it in bags in the freezer so that at the holidays I pulled them out and actually made a peach cobbler crisp kind of thing. And it was wonderful. And then I had dried blueberries in them. In there. It was really good. Uh, pears are great. Pear pie is wonderful. Crazy. And then all those little purees. You know, you have, like, too much of something or just this little bit of something you're not going to use. I like to put them in different little sized containers. So, like these are, um, right here is a muffin tin. So if you just puree up something and put it in a muffin right. tin, pop them out and put them in a Ziploc bag, suck your air out, and you can freeze those for. And that's kind of a nice size portion to use for something. I do that with like, uh, I do parsley frozen a lot. When I have too much parsley in there, I puree it all up, put a little water in there, and I do, that's the one I do in the, the little mini muffin tins or an ice cream tray, same thing. Uh, but that's kind of if you want a little more of something. Uh, watermelon is a really good one to puree. Kids just love that frozen watermelon. And that's one that, like, you know, for me and my husband, buy a big watermelon, it takes us forever to eat it. So we'll buy like a really big one and just puree it. I put the recipe that I did with the preschool kids over there if you want to take it. It's just basically orange juice with um, watermelon. And you just puree it and put it on little sticks like that. The kids love it. Uh, pesto is wonderful for freezing. I love freezing pesto. I have a whole little suction on my door of my freezer with all the different kinds of pestos. So kale pesto, that's what we're making in my class. Anybody make kale pesto? It is so good. It was the favorite of the class. It was the one that did the last workshop that I was thinking, I don't know, are these people going to like this kale thing? Maybe they'll never come back. Everybody said it was their favorite thing. And it had sunflower seeds in it. And it didn't have any cheese in it. So it was a vegan one. It was really tasty. Uh, basil pesto, obviously. But other things too, like cilantro, arugula. Parsley pesto is wonderful. So, uh, you know, I, I just love that's a great way to, to just preserve all those herbs in the summertime and then have things that you can cook with in the winter. Uh, and then juices, totally. Freezing, you know, we have abundant juices like apple or grape or carrots. Those are great for freezing and using them later. And then I like to use uh, butters a lot. So, taking like that picture up in the right hand corner is like herbs that have been chopped up and put in with melted butter and then frozen in little trays. You can also do it with olive oil. So if you have too many herbs, it just makes it easier when you're going to like make a soup or a sauce later on. You just pull out the little cube and pop it in. It's already you've already got your oil and your herbs, and you want to saute something. It's now you've got a flavored oil that kind of adds to the taste of the dish you're making. So for soup, sauces, vegetables, rice, it's great to have those. So just pop it in the pot. Part, um, pasta. That's a great one. You just like if you're really into you cook your pasta and then. Toss on your little uh, butters on there. So freezing is one of my favorites, and uh, I should say that one of the 
things that we're doing, I'll tell you a little bit more about the grant project, but we're buying equipment to make it really easy for people to freeze things in large amounts, uh, easily and liquids. Because like food savers, you know, the regular seal meal thing, it's really hard to seal like a soup or something like that. So there's these other machines that are called like a cry vac or a, anyway, they're, they're a vacuum sealer that are large enough to have a slant tray inside. So you put your, like, your soup at the slant, you fill it up and it seals it on both ends and you get this, you know, about a gallon of soup, or you can do it in smaller bags as well. But then you can, you know, keep in the freezer and just, you can do it in bulk amounts. So if you have, you know, an assembly line of people going, you know, want to make a huge amount of soup for an event you're having or whatever, and you can get these and make the soup ahead and just have it in the freezer. I'm working with, like, the Casper Community Center on the coast, and they do these really great breakfasts. Anyone know breakfast? Yes, yes. Oh my God. <laughs> I just went for the first time. It was so great. So I'm working with them, and one of the things we can do is get one of those machines so that they, when they have a lot of produce in the middle of summer, they're going to do these community canning days, but also community freezing days. So they'll just freeze up like batches of chili, and tomato sauces, and all sorts of things that then they'll have in their freezers for their sauces and soups. And they also do a pub night. So they make food for their pub night. And so this machine will help them to be able to like fill up their freezer with things pull up these fresh products. So it's pretty cool. So canning, I'm sure many of you have done canning before. So it's basically um, applying heat, driving out the air, and creating a seal that protects the contents. So and canning is a wonderful thing to do, but to me canning is a lot of work. And if you're by yourself when you try to can, it just seems to me I'm always like, oh, I want to get that kettle out. It's just, too much trouble, and, there, and it's also kind of limited, but unless you have a pressure canner and you really know what you're doing, uh, you know, there are only so many products you can make. And now with the new cottage food law, you guys are familiar with that law where you can make things out of your own kitchen, it's still, the rules are like really, really restricted in what you can make, because they are so fearful that people are going to make things that are uh, not a high acid food and, and that someone will get sick. So they're giving you a list of things, like, like the jams that you can make really, really high amount of sugar. Like, so much that you, you know, we, I made it once, and I was like, I'm never making that, it's got too much sugar. So the products that you can do with the cottage food bar are very, very restrictive. So canning is fun, but I would say canning is more fun with people, with a big group of people. So what do you have a freezer? For what? Or if you don't have a freezer. Or if you don't have a freezer, there you go. Canning, yeah, exactly. So there's pros and cons to, to everything. Yeah, the freezer, you know, it takes up room, and if you don't have one, um, yeah, canning is, canning is fabulous. Um, just making sure that you're doing it right and following the proper procedures. I also brought a binder over there. If you guys have seen this one from USDA, it's, a, it's downloadable online, but it's a really, really thorough binder of information on canning. It's all the regulations, and it covers everything from this whole chapter just on canning tomatoes. It goes through food safety. It talks about fermenting. Uh, it's just a really, really thorough information. I think it was put out in 2009, but it's, you know, they, then they update. When you go to that website uh, to look for it, you see they have all these updates on there. It's the National Food Preservation, National Center for Food Home Preservation. Anyway, I'll show it to you up there. So canning, uh, nutritional values are you maintained. Uh, heat destroys the microorganisms that cause the spoilage, so that's a good thing. And great for using an abundant crop. Uh, for me, typically jellies, jams, sauces, pickles, um, high acid fruits, unless you get into pressure canning. And then it's always good that you can keep them for a couple of years, too, on the shelf stable. It's always a nice thing. So let me tell you a little bit about the workshops I'm doing. Uh, talking about canning with a group of people. I really love to cook, and I've cooked for so, so many years, and I love being in the kitchen with other people. And so when I had this opportunity with this grant, I was like, wow, we could just put all this together. Uh, what we're doing right now are these workshops. So we call them the Healthy Harvest Workshops, and uh, it's, the, it's, it's hands-on, a group of people, like eight people seems to be the ideal, get together in a commercial kitchen, so we have the Ukiah Senior Center kitchen that we're using, which is a wonderful kitchen that already gets used, so we're able to rent that. Um, we're working with the Casper Community Center, and they're doing uh, 
series of canning classes, plus they're doing these community canning days, community freezing days, <coughs> and they're also doing a series on uh, for families on how to cook healthy meals for your family. And I'm also working with the Big Valley Range over Lake Park, and they're just getting started trying to get some things going, so I'm trying to help them. And then we have the opportunity to work with the Little Lake Range here at Willis. So uh, the workshops I've done in Ukiah were featuring local specialty crops, because that's what the grant's about, specialty crops, which isn't hard because that's fruits and vegetables and nuts, and actually you can use beans as well, so we're able to make a lot of food. Uh, and we buy it from local farmers, and we're looking at this online food hub system. We're going to be able to order everything online for the workshops. So this is our, our goal about a month from now, and there'll be some special pricing in there. So for me, when I'm going to do a workshop, I'll be able to go online and get a better deal than uh, maybe pay at the farmer's market. So we're getting the, these farmers on board, and we have 12 farmers right now. They're all signed on, and they're like, yes, we will do this. It, it's not like you can pick and choose, like I want one bunch of kale and three bunch of onions. It has to be like, I want a case of kale and I want a case of tomatoes, which is great because that, if you get a group of people together in the kitchen, you know, a case of tomatoes and kale is processed in no time. So looking at how can we order large amounts of food, bring eight people together, and create products that, that we can um, take, people can take home. So we have recipes, I've worked on a lot of different recipes. I have a binder here that's filled with some uh, recipes that we're using in the workshops, and then really looking at products that everybody just takes at home. So the cost of the workshop has to be based around whatever we buy, because the grant doesn't provide that. It doesn't pay for the food. It covers the equipment, the rental of the kitchen, all the other materials that I bring. Uh, and I've been doing it with uh, Carolyn, Caroline Radici, who has Black Dog Farms, which is in Redwood Valley. She sells at the markets. And she just, she's a jam girl. She's the queen. and so. Together, it's a really great uh, pair because uh, I focus more on the, the cooking part of it and she's more into the jam making. And so we kind of break the group up and start on some jam and, and then uh, move on to some other projects. And we have money in the grant to buy equipment as well. So that's like I was saying about the vacuum sealer. It's something that could benefit the Willits Range and that we can buy equipment that people might want to use to even go into business for themselves because the Grange rents that kitchen for people who making jam or um, different products that they sell. So it's a commercial kitchen for them. And so if I find out that there are people who are really interested in going one particular route and need some equipment like freezing or canning or whatever, we can actually support them by buying the equipment and helping them get started in business. So I see that as a real plus. But first we just want to start workshops. So that means getting people to understand what we're doing. And I'll show you a little bit about the kind of things we're doing in Ukiah. Here's some pictures of some of the, you know, just getting together and chopping. We were chopping apples, so we had the apple slicers and then uh, carrots. We were roasting vegetables down at the end of the table there. And then we all just stood around and kind of learned how some people had never canned before, so they were really excited to learn how. We kind of walked everybody through step by step. And then this was roasting the butternut squash. We did have a ton of butternut squash, so we thought, let's just roast it up. So we uh, scooped it all out and uh, made a really yummy Tunisian butternut squash soup that was really great. Everybody went home with a quart of soup and everyone went home with a quart of puree and the recipe so that they could make it again sometime. So I'm trying to like, figure out how to like, you know, things you can use tonight, things you can put in your freezer and use a month from now, things you can you know, can product you can put on the shelf, and then recipes if you ever want to make it yourself. Or just come back next. Uh, so this is kind of a rough outline of what I proposed in the grant that we would do. So kind of looking seasonally at like spring, the things that would be available, the greens, the carrots, the beets, the peas, the cabbage. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So we've done some soups, we're doing some salad dressings. Uh, and then getting into more the, in the summer, the berries and the plums. And you know, we have too many apricots around here, but we can't canning. Uh, then getting into a lot of herbs and freezing. It's not necessarily it's all going to be in this order. But these are some of the optional things, and I have a whole volume of pages of different things, different recipes and ideas of dishes we can make, but I'm also asking other people, what do you want to learn how to make? You know, what, what ideas do you have? What recipes do you want to bring to the table? So looking at bringing groups together and letting them almost customize the way they want to do it. 
So tomorrow, I just thought I'd share with you what we're doing tomorrow. I have eight people in the kitchen in Ukiah, and we're going to do a two different kinds of jam, a strawberry lemon jam, and then a orange rosemary jam. Oh, sounds really good. good. And then once we take all the peels off, we have the citrus peels, we pour jars of vinegar, and then add the citrus peels and fresh herbs, and so everybody went home with an infused vinegar. And then we already did this workshop once, and I'm sorry, we already did it. Uh, and then we did the oven roasted vegetables. Tons of beautiful vegetables, three colors of beets. And so everybody just chopped them all up. That's the picture in the middle there. I put them in the oven, we took them out, we put them in a pan, put a little crumb topping on with some rosemary and Parmesan cheese. And then everybody took home a container of that for dinner that night. Had like four servings in. And then we made the kale pesto, which was really a hit, and we just ate it on uh, pieces of carrot. And everybody really liked that. And then uh, we're going to, this time we're going to do a spinach mixed green edible flower salad. So we're collecting like all the borages and calendulas that are out there now. And we have a farmer that's giving us a whole bunch of little baby greens. And so we're going to have everybody kind of custom make themselves a little salad mix. And we're going to make a fresh strawberry and vinegar. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. And I'm going to make one for you right now. So I have everything ready to make you the strawberry vinegar. And I'd love to hear from you guys about your ideas about Willits and what people might be interested in doing in Willits in terms of processing food and how you see groups of people getting together. Because um, I, I did advertise and I have to say I didn't get any phone calls and I thought, well, maybe Willits doesn't want to do this. But <laughs> I think there are lots of opportunities. And I know there are lots of people who are interested in preserving food, and I know people grow their own food. Uh, and like I said, I, I feel like it's, even if you do grow your own food, it is so much more fun to do it with other people. And it goes so much faster, and you have all the equipment there. So one of the girls is in her class, okay, so this is fresh strawberries from the farmer's market, which I just sell, they sell at Mariposa as well. One of the girls in the class, uh, she made the jam, and she loved it so much, she went home, and she made it. Um, the next weekend, and she said it took her three and a half hours to make the five jars of jam. Whereas our workshop was three hours, and she went home with so much more. So she was like, it just, and it wasn't nearly as fun. It just wasn't the same thing. She's like, I really didn't have a good time. So this is just strawberries, and then this is a cup of, it's Meyer lemon, and it's half orange, half Meyer lemon, with the rind in there as well. And then this is, Somebody tried this California balsamic they sell at the farmer's market. And it's so good. This is like the best balsamic I think I have ever had. It's really thick, really yummy. So we're going to put a little bit, we're going to put three tablespoons of balsamic in there. See how thick it is? Mm -hmm. Do you have the recipe here for this or should I, I write it down? I do, I have it right here. Okay, good. And then one of the tricks to getting salad dressing you know, too runny is to have something thickened in there. So by pureeing up these strawberries, it's going to help make it thick. So then we're going to put a little bit of black, I mean, white pepper, a bit of salt, and <laughs> 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 that's my trick. And then we're going to put a little bit of Dijon, Dijon, I think this is good, stone ground Dijon mustard, which also always helps to thicken any salad dressing. Dry mustard always helps too. Okay, so then basically, we're going to puree it up and then add a little bit of oil. Okay, so pour it in here. better to add the oil at the end so that it emulsifies and gets thicker. I wonder if somebody wants to pour in the oil for me. I can volunteer. She's <laughs> need a quarter cup of oil. And I use rice bran, which also comes from the same company, because it's such a mild flavor and it has a really high smoke point, so it's also really good for cooking with. But uh, it's just a really nice really neutral flavor oil.
It's nice and thick and strawberry puree seasoned up. Lovely. All right, so what I do with this, and there's many things you could do with the dressing, but typically I do uh, spinach. But this week I went to the farmer's market and I saw there's a new couple in town, and they're uh, near Ridgewood Ranch Woods, and they're just really excited about growing greens, and I went on their Facebook page and met all about them, and it's really cool. So he sold me these beautiful different colors of greens. So he had this lovely little, uh, it's like a baby romaine or something like that, and then this, this lovely red one. And then this other sort of little buttery gem thing that was just really great. So they're just they're local. I think they're probably going to sell at the farmers market um, here. They were in Kite. I think they're going to sell here as well. It's called like Tequio, Tequio, T Q U I O. Hmm. So then what I do is take them. these are uh, sugar snap peas that I just cut up in little pieces, and then we're going to add. A bunch of strawberries too. So we'll have the fresh strawberries as well as the strawberry puree. And then some dried cranberries. There's <laughs> <laughs> a fun one to get kids to eat because it is a little like desserts. Kids and salads, right? So I just put like a little bit on here rather than mixing it all together because mix it all together you don't want your cranberries and your strawberries end up in the bottom and you can get them all distributed. So instead, I'm going to make it like this and then we'll put this on here too. Awesome. So it looks really colorful and mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful. And then you can also put um, I have some almonds that we're going to put on there, if you want. Uh, also, really good with feta cheese or goat cheese. So, shamrock goat cheese from the market, so good. Too, because we're going to be able to buy in bulk, 
Well, you just find like one bunch of lettuce and one bunch of basil. It's so much work for them to just process those one little things at a time. I mean, it's better if you're doing a CSA because that, those boxes are usually uh, delivered with you know, right. better things you're worry about getting a better price for. But, yeah, I hear you. I just feel like I'm supporting something right. that's really going to help that family get bigger and bigger and stronger. And that's where my feeling is. You might feel like it's about you know, to have this conversation. Yeah. And, and then she's like, well, I guess I hope it's quite smart. Yeah, and sometimes some farmers charge too much, and then the guy next to them has something for less, and I'll go to the one that has it for a little bit less. But I think the idea, too, is that we want to grow these farmers into the, where they have the capacity to sell wholesale. And that's what a lot of what we've been doing at NCO is food health thing is trying to get them to grow and grow and say, we will buy it if you grow it. And so if we don't stop buying it, then they're going to go out of business and won't grow it. So that's where I feel like I'm supporting the future of the growth of that. And we're trying to get them to grow and sell to the schools. Well, they need to do that on a larger scale. And they're afraid to because they don't think that they will sell and it won't, won't happen. But we just keep saying, yes, it will. We will keep buying it. So every time... I spend a dollar at the I feel like encouraging them to keep growing. And then what constitutes local? Yeah. Well, for, for this grant, I mean, yeah, there's no definition of local. Everybody makes it up. Everybody see it. Everybody mm -hmm. people say 100 miles. And this grant, local is Lake and Mendocino County. Yeah. And so that, that's where the grant funding came, which is wonderful because what we realized is this food hub distribution is going to be fabulous because the coast grows very different produce than Lake County. And so we're going to be able to go back and forth. So in the middle of summer, when there are no le lettuce, there's no lettuce available, the coast has lettuce. And they're happy to ship it over. So there's going to be this truck that's going to be going back and forth. There's a whole route that's plant planned. Pick it up on the coast, bring it to Willits, drop it off in Willits. So people will drop their food in Willits to go both ways. So uh, John Bailey's working on that project. He's done a fabulous job figuring it out so that we'll all be able to benefit from everybody's farm produce in all of Lake and Mendocino County and have crops available all throughout the summer and the winter from different areas. So I think that's a real win win. And then they will scale up, they'll grow more because they'll see, oh look, there's a need. People in Willits want our lettuce so they'll grow more. So just trying to get them to understand that we are supporting them. We encourage them, please grow and we will buy it. And then the prices will drop too as they become bigger. Could you give us some idea of what the price range of the workshops are that you'll be doing? That so we're doing? Well, I did a focus group in Ukiah and had 15 people and asked them that question after I told them about the grant. Uh, and they said that they would pay $20 because that would be $20 worth of food times, uh, we're going to have 10 people, so it was like $200 worth of produce. So that was a lot, and that's what they wanted to do because they thought they're going to come for three hours on a Saturday. Let's do as much as we possibly can. And so they went home with a lot of food. Um, but it doesn't have to be twenty dollars. It could be a ten dollar workshop, and you can still have eight people in a kitchen with eighty dollars worth of produce and make jam and salad dressing and roast some vegetables or any other things. There's so much we can do. So you really focus a lot on what people um, can take home with them. Mm -hmm. It's all about taking. Yeah, yeah. And when everybody walked out the door, there was nothing left. We stand there with the dirty dishes, and they took everything. It was great. Then we had the boxes, and they were so they excited. Were really yeah. excited. Yeah. And besides that, like I was telling Karen, that I encourage people if you know somebody who has too much of something and they want to contribute it to the workshop, that's great. So I went to Santa Rosa, which is, I know that's not local, but my cousin happens to have a beautiful orange tree, and the next door neighbors have a Meyer lemon tree, and they were full. And they had eaten one orange, and they were never going to eat an orange out of that tree. So I picked the whole thing. I probably had 100 pounds of oranges. So that's how we were able to supplement, and people went home with even more. And I, I know that's going to happen. The workshop we're having tomorrow, a girl called and said she has tons of arugula, and she can't possibly eat it all. And so she's going to bring it, and everybody will go home with a bag of arugula. And uh, last, also, Richard Jeske's bringing collards tomorrow. So we're going to go home with collards, and we're going to cook some collards. You know, so those little fun contributions from people that can really extend the workshop into using what they have too much of, and then they trade with everybody else. That's what we end up with a lot of food. I mean, basically, when pears do well in woods, we have tons of extra right. pears. <laughs> so the, the hard part is, like, 
that, that when we glean, you know, we would be glad to share some of that produce with you, but that may not coincide with um, when your workshops are. So that's well, really key. I can plan workshops anytime, as long as the kitchens are available. So I'm not I'm not wed to any certain day. I'm doing them on Wednesdays and Saturday, not every Wednesday every Saturday, but twice a month. So I'm doing a Wednesday and I'm doing a Saturday. And then I'm repeating them. So it's Wednesday, Saturday, and then the next Wednesday and Saturday are going to be something different, depending on what's available. So strawberries are available now, so we're going to do a lot of strawberries. So if people in Wallens are interested in attending a workshop, should they be contacting you or do you have a waiting list? Or yeah. Yeah, I have a brochure there that has all the information on it, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we're going to be doing, kind of going around to different groups and telling them what we're doing, and I'm talking about the range in a couple of weeks to find out uh, their thoughts on it. And, I mean, there is very much behind it, so we really want to see it happen. I mean, I can see just group, different groups of people too, like young moms, or you know, somebody said, oh, go to the Zumba group, they would love to do something like that. So just kind of finding these pockets of people who just want to self-form their own eight people and mm -hmm. pick the day, pick the time, and pick the amount, and then, you know, come up for whatever. And I just organized a class coming up at the end of the month that has all couples. <clears throat> people said they wanted to come with their, a friend of mine said she wanted to bring her husband, I said they're great, so she told her friend, I want to bring my husband too, and pretty soon I had four couples, so mm -hmm. you know, a couples workshop, a little different thing, how to preserve your relationship. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a grant that only goes for one year, and I'd love to see you know, as many people benefit from it. It's not my money, it's not my grant, it's your community, as well as uh, the other three communities I'm working with. So, however we can get things happening, spread the word, and we'd be happy to come up to work. Would, would a workshop um, about, that was, you know, to plant an herb garden, say like that, in one of those, did that cross over too far into something else? Yeah, so uh, planting an herb garden could be something that the gardens project does. Yeah, working with harvesting the herbs and making them into something in the kitchen could be, I could see how they could flow together. That would yeah. be really fun. Yeah. It could be that we do a bunch of herbs and make a bunch of different items and then teach people how to make it, take it home. Yeah. Yeah, that could be nice. I like that. Um, one person that I'm thinking of that I connected with last year, and it was really great, was the, the cook at the Willis Charter School, because he's really into taking uh, rough, you know, food, uh -huh. really ex extra food, clean food, uh -huh. um, and getting the kids involved in making, like, breakfast foods, uh -huh. and lunch foods, and then they also um, prepare food for like certain events like the Phillips Christmas Fair, you know, they mm -hmm. sell food. So I just think that because it seems like the young people really get into it, mm -hmm. and the teenagers too. So. Yeah. And there, it could be, and it doesn't have to be at the Grange either. It could be that they want to host a workshop in the right. kitchen. At, at yeah, the and kitchen. talk to them yeah. about that. Right. Because if they want to host something and maybe invite like their parents or do even one with parents and children, you know, we can provide the equipment and everything that's needed. Um, and yeah. 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 That would be a good connection. Daily bread is another place to do it. They do cooking for them provide a meal. I wonder if it could be a cooking workshop. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Work with what's at hand, or, you know. Yeah. I don't know how they would come up with money because a lot of, of the individuals so have a lot of money. That's the idea that they get a free meal. I wonder if other people in the community might be willing to attend a workshop there. I, one of the, the ideas I had, I think this came out of the, the Casper Community Center, was the idea of having people volunteer to come to these community canning days that then will benefit the Casper Community Center because they'll have this freezer full of canned goods and they'll have canned products on their shelf. But people would donate their time for the Casper Community Center, which you, know, you could do for a food bank or whatever, so the product goes to them. And then the people who come would maybe get to take a couple things home, like take a jar at home, but donate your time for three hours to help can for your community. I think that's a really good idea because, you know, we often try, or the leaders, we try to donate food, mm -hmm. and then they'll say, no, we can't take any more, 
And although they're good about trying to process some of it, but they don't have the yeah. flavor. So that idea of actually uh, getting people to volunteer to can for you know they donate it to daily bread. Yeah, right. Okay. That could be that's that's doable. I mean, that could be done. Uh, I have the funds to like pay for the rental of the Grange kitchen. Well, they could be kitchen, but I don't know if it's a commercial kitchen. It has to be if they work out. It. it must daily bread. Yeah. Like daily bread is a yeah church kitchen. So, it's, it's, but it, it's supposedly a, I don't think it has to be. If the okay. people are staying there and eating it, then it's that type of thing. It doesn't have to be. Okay. It has to be if they wanted to sell it. But you can do a church kitchen that's not commercial. Okay. As long as you're not going to sell the product. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, so when so people when we're take things home, you're providing the plastic bags, the jars? The uh, I did mostly glass jars, canning jars. And your grant piece for that? Or that's mm -hmm. part of the... No space for that, and then just asking when they come back to bring the jars back, and we we'll just keep refilling them. So, wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Sounds like a really, excuse me, a fabulous program, oh, and a great opportunity for it. Yeah. yeah, I would love to. I'm really looking forward to the next year, just like blooming it. Uh, and we're just getting started right now, so we've only done four workshops. It's really taking off. I think I can also speak for everyone here that we'd like to know when you're opening your restaurant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.